Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Barbara Stanwyck and Tyrone Power in This Above All. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Once more, it's opening night in the Lux Radio Theater. But a new kind of opening night. Without benefit of searchlights or brightly lit marquee. Like Broadway's Great White Way, Hollywood Boulevard's Neon Lane is dimmed out for the duration. But there's no dim out on glamour and adventure inside the Lux Radio Theater tonight. As we present Tyrone Power and Barbara Stanwyck in the 20th Century Fox drama, This Above All based on the novel by Eric Knight. It's the first great love story to come out of this war. A story of an English soldier and a girl in uniform who gives him the fighting heart to do his duty. You'll hear Barbara Stanwyck as that girl and Tyrone Power in the same part he played on the screen. The soldier just back from the terror of Dunkirk. This, above all, is what the critics call an important drama and what the public calls great entertainment. And don't be backward about telling us what other plays and stars you'd like to hear. Because you are the real sponsors of this program, you and Lux Toilet Soap. You and Lux have been raising the curtain here for eight years now. And as we go into our ninth season, we renew our pledge to bring you the best entertainment America can produce, the newest plays and the finest dramatic artists. There's a reserved seat in this national theater for everyone, and the more the merrier. Your season ticket is that familiar cake of Lux Toilet Soap. And again, the more the merrier. And now for the ninth consecutive year, the thrilling moment arrives as the curtain rises on the first act of This Above All, starring Tyrone Power as Clive Briggs and Barbara Stanwyck as Prudence Cathaway. This is the story of two people, a man and a woman from different worlds. One reared in poverty in the slums of London, the other a child of England's aristocracy. It's also a story of England today, an England in which social barriers are forgotten in the united effort of all her people to fight this war. At 6.50 this evening in the forest of Compiègne, an armistice was signed between France and Germany. The resistance of France has ended, her fall complete. In Berlin tonight, a government spokesman declared that the conquest of Britain by the end of September is now definitely assured. Well, there's one good thing about the wireless. You can always turn it off. Yes, it's that announcer fellow that annoys me, Harris. Talks as if he's got a mouth full of golf balls. Excuse me, sir. Dr. Roger is here. Oh, Roger, come in. I'm sorry. Have I kept you all waiting? Oh, it's all right, Roger. Your hospital must be getting some pretty bad cases. Have you heard the news, Roger? Yes, we know where we stand now, don't we? Well, Napoleon conquered the whole of Europe, but he never touched England. Napoleon didn't have 15,000 bombers. Well, there's no need for us to get excited. Don't you think perhaps it's time we did get excited, Iris? Why, Roger? Don't you know what our enemies say in their prayers every night? They say, please, Lord, keep the English from getting excited for one more year and we shall never need your help again. Oh, for goodness sake, let's talk about something cheerful. Dinner is served, sir. Oh, fine. Now sit down before the soup gets cold. Parson, did Miss Prudence tell you what had delayed her? No, sir, she didn't. I wonder where she is. Roger, you're Prudence's father, and it's no concern of mine. But if you want my opinion, she's not behaving in a manner befitting her position. Really? Yesterday afternoon, she took Bert Higgins, the gardener, for a drive in her car instead of attending Lord Evesham's charity party. Iris, Bert Higgins is convalescing. I took his appendix out last month. Well, that doesn't confer special privileges. I'm not against equality, Roger. Hello, but everyone. Well, Prudence. Mm, high time, I'd say, Hello, my girl. Hello, grandfather. Well, young lady, you are late. Yes, I know. Aunt Iris, I'm terribly sorry. Parson, bring Miss Prudence her dinner. Well... What have you been up to? Oh, Father, I got delayed in Gosley. I had so many things to do, some shopping, and I had my hair cut, and, well, I joined the WAF. The so WAF? The, the WAF, what? the Women's Auxiliary Air Force. Well, we hadn't even heard that you'd applied for a commission. I didn't apply for a commission, Grandfather. I joined the ranks. Oh, oh but my dear Prudence, I, 
I could have arranged for you to be an officer. I don't want to be an officer till I've learned to be a private. Are you aware that Annie Smith, who scrubs the schoolhouse floors, has joined the WAF as a private? Yes, Aunt Horace. I told her she ought to. Well, um, uh, Prudence, for generations, the Cathaways have been leaders, not followers. In joining this woman's army, you're deliberately throwing aside certain, oh, shall I say, uh, traditions. Mm, quite possibly she's thinking of something else. What exactly are you suggesting, Aunt Iris? I'm suggesting nothing, my dear. But some of you girls of today would do almost anything in the world to be different, even at the expense of your family. Forgive me, Aunt Iris, but when you talk, I seem to hear words oozing through the holes of a moth-eaten sofa. Prudence, remember where you are. I do remember where I am. I'm in 1940, and you're in 1880. Your kind of thinking is more dangerous to us than Hitler is. Susie, yes, what? I mean it. You believe that 40 million people exist in England to make you comfortable. You hate this war because you knock your shins in a blackout. You grumble at it because it's deprived you of your favorite German bath salts. And you fear it because the common men who are doing the fighting may suddenly begin to doubt the importance of risking their lives to keep you an immortal part of England. Parsons, give me a glass of sherry. Here, Sergeant. Here, Sergeant. Company. Dismissed. Oh, all this red type. I can see we're here without calling out all them names. Say, you. You live in Gosling? No, I live across the downs near Walsham. I'm local. Say, do you know any boys around here? No, I don't. Oh, well, you leave that to me. I'll fix you up. What? What are you doing tonight? Why, nothing. Well, my boyfriend, Joe, he called me up this morning. He's joining the Navy tomorrow, and tonight's the last chance he's got to propose to me. Well, perhaps he'll propose tonight. I'm sure he will. Oh. I've never got so close as I did the other night. He started putting grass down my neck, like he always does when he's on the point of something. He'd just begin to ask me when the air raid siren went. Well, there's still tonight. Oh, there ain't a hope. Unless we do something. He called me up this morning to say he's bringing a chum with him. Say, come out with me tonight. Come out and take your chum away, please. But I, I don't even hey, know... Hey, Violet, you're on duty in the next hut. Come in. Eight o'clock tonight. Now, you won't let me down, will you? Oh, I know you won't. Say, what did you say your name was? Prudence. Prudence Cataway. Is that you, Joe? That you, boy. Here we are. Oh, you've got a friend, eh? Uh, this is my chum, Prue Cataway. Prue thought she'd like to take a walk. Well, it's fine. This is my chum, Clive Briggs. Oh, pleased to meet you, Mr. Briggs. How do you do? Good evening. Well, uh, shall we have a stroll? Come on, Joe. This either cook's tour all trooping around in a bunch. See you back here at 10 o'clock. Now, be good, you two. Yes, yeah, see you right here. 10 o'clock. Well, we're stranded. And in the dark, too. Is that what they usually do with you when you come out with them? I don't usually come out with them. Oh, I beg your pardon. You're a very superior wife, aren't you? I'm not in the least superior. As a matter of fact, I came to help a friend. Or didn't you realize that Joe and Violet happened to be in love? I didn't. And to be honest with you, I'm not in the least interested in Joe or Violet. Listen. They're bombing Dover. It may be Canterbury. Oh, it's farther north, over the Thames Estuary. They're going right through to London. They'll be bombing our camp one of these days. <laughs> Don't worry. They're not going to waste bombs on a WAF camp. Why not? My dear girl, don't you realize that a big bomb costs a thousand pounds? We could go around the world on the price of one bomb. We'd need a bomb each to do it well. It's a waste, doesn't it? Bang goes another trip around the world. Cigarette? Thanks. Hey, tell me, what's the English aristocracy doing in the ranks of the wife? I don't know what you mean. You didn't sound like the rest of the girls here. Have you any objection to my being in the ranks of the wife? I don't object. I was only thinking the ranks might. Oh, well, they're quite broad-minded, you know. In fact, they're a fine lot of girls. Yes, they're all right, I suppose. And putting them into uniform doesn't transform them into Joan of Arc, you know. You don't believe in girls in uniform. You don't believe in very much, do you? I believe in people who know what they're doing and where they're going. You're bitter about something, aren't you? We'd better be moving on. It's almost ten. We'd better say good night. Uh, shall I see you again? I, I don't know. How about Saturday in the afternoon? I can't promise. I may be busy. I'll wait for you in the square by the statue. You suppose I can't come? If you can't, it won't make any difference. <laughs> well, at least you tell the truth. Good night. <laughs> Hello 
Hello. I am sorry if I'm late. I had an awful job to get away. That's all right. So you're the girl I met in the dark, huh? Yes, this is me. Well, uh, shall we go for a walk? If you want. What's that? Well, ordinarily, I'd say it was the Germans. But now it happens to be thunder. Oh, I was afraid it was going to rain. Uh, here it comes. Oh, and we'll be stoked. Isn't there some place we can go? Well, what do boys and girls do under these conditions? It depends upon where they are and how they feel. Some of them get into hollow trees and others go to the cinema. Well, I expect all the hollow trees are full by now. That leaves only the cinema. Or perhaps... Oh, but look over there. Oh, the Albion Temperance and Commercial Hotel. Come on. Well, it's dry anyway. Coming, coming. What is it? Uh, we want a room, please. Yes? Yes, we want a room where we can have a fire lit to dry these things and have some tea sent up. Mm. We don't have no room. No, but we only I just... say we don't have no room. This ain't the sort of place you want. I got my reputation to keep up. Reputation? I'll say you have, you dirty little pipsqueak. The first thing you need to do is open the windows and let the smell out. Then open your mind and let the smell out of that. Clive, let's go. Gladly. People think they can get away with anything today. Well, this is a different kind of hotel. Phew. I'm sorry. Don't think of it. Well, I, I can't help thinking of it. It made me feel suddenly dirty. Well, I suppose he's fighting the war in his own way. <laughs> Still raining. Well, where do we go from here? Well, we're not having much luck. Might as well walk to keep warm. We might pick up the bus on the way. Oh, look, there's a shed. We can watch for the bus and keep dry at the same time. Let's make a run for it. Cozy enough in here. It's dry anyway. I think it's lovely. Well, we may as well sit down and wait till the rain stops. It's been a great day, hasn't it? <laughs> I know, Clive. We'll have to try some other time. Hey, you're shivering. No, I'm all right. Here, I've got something to fix you up. Blends neatly with the weather, too. What is it? Whiskey. You like some? Never touch it. Go on, it'll do you good. Oh, here. Always take the cork out of a bottle when you hand it to a lady. Mm, especially when the lady is a novice at drinking. But no, thank you. Well, here's to you. Good? Ah. <sighs> Hmm. Tell me, uh, did you ever get Stinko? Blind, unconscious Stinko? No, have you? Two nights ago. Blind, blotto, out. Why? Why not? Well, people generally have good reasons for going blind, blotto, out, don't they? I suppose so. You know, when I met you the other night, I couldn't really see anything, and yet somehow I knew exactly what you would look like in the daylight. Well, how do I look? Oh, you're quite good-looking, really. The nose a little too fine, the mouth a little on the big side, and one of your ears sticks out a little bit more than the other. Did you know your face was slightly lopsided? Now, that'll do. Wait a minute. <laughs> but your eyes are good. Yes, a, a nice deep brown, a bit tired looking. Late hours, perhaps. Well, you're better than a smack in the lug yourself. What's a smack in the lug? Oh, a friend of mine called Monty. If he says you're better than a smack in the lug, it means you're all right. As a matter of fact, you are, Prue. Please, don't start that. I'm not starting anything. I, I just said you're all right. Clive, I wanted to ask you, why aren't you in uniform? You sure you won't have a drink? Just a little one? Oh, no, it would never do for me to get blind, Stinko. Well, you might like it. No, it just makes me talk, that's all. Oh, not that I can't take it. Well, last Christmas I had three glasses of port and then won a ping-pong match. Did you? Don't look at me like that. I'm going to kiss you. You know, I might just as well have taken that drink. I feel stinko. Quite stinko, in fact. Come on, we'd better go. Why, what's the matter? Nothing, we're going, that's all. But it's still raining, Clyde. We're getting out of here, rain or no rain. I'll get you back to camp. for you. Over there, by the stile. For me? Thanks. Clive. I heard you were leaving today. Yes, we're going to Boxgrove. Well, when will I see you again? Oh, there's a bus. I must go. How long will you be away? Three weeks. Three weeks? Is that a long time? 
Well, no, it's just... You'll be gone when I get back? No, I'll be here, Prue. I promise you I will. You know, Clive, when I get back, I'll be due for leave. You will? Mm -hmm. Well, let's go away, then. I know a beautiful place on the seacoast at Leaford. I'm afraid I couldn't. I'll have to go home to Tunbridge. I promise to... Come with me, Clive. Me? To the ancestral home of the Cathaways? <laughs> the pride of the family bringing home the man she found in the dark. You're not funny. I've never been more serious. Come on, Prue. We're leaving. I've got to go, Clive. Goodbye. Goodbye, Prue. And remember, you're going with me to Leaford when you come back in three weeks. No, I'm not. You're coming with me to Tunbridge. You mean Leaford. Tunbridge. Goodbye. In just a few moments, Mr. DeMille and our stars, Barbara Stanwyck and Tyrone Power, will bring us Act Two of This Above All. And now, here's a young man and his girl tuning in for a little dance music. Ah, here we are, Betty. Who wouldn't love you? Who wouldn't care? You're so enchanting, people must stare. Hey, that's good. Well, that song could have been written for you, darling. I know you've guessed it. Betty is one of those girls with a fresh, lovely complexion. A Lux Soap complexion. She knows the screen star's secret. That regular care with active lather, Lux Soap's active lather, is the smartest care that any girl can give her skin. There's a reason for this, of course. The rich, creamy lather of Lux Toilet Soap removes stale cosmetics, dust and dirt, swiftly, thoroughly, yet so gently, too. Is your skin as appealing, as smooth and soft as it could be? No? Then why don't you try Hollywood's famous 30-day care that women everywhere are enthusiastic about? Every day, regularly, take an active lather facial with gentle Lux Toilet Soap. Beautiful Jean Arthur tells you how she does it. I pat the creamy Lux soap lather lightly in, rinse with warm water and then with cool. Then with a towel, I pat gently to dry. This facial leaves my skin feeling softer, smoother. You'll like the caressing touch of Lux toilet soap's fine, rich lather on your skin. And as you use this luxurious soap, you'll know you're giving your skin protection it needs. Don't take chances with complexion loveliness. Give your skin beauty care every day with the soap nine out of ten screen stars use. The soap that's as mild and pure as money can buy. Get three cakes of gentle Lux toilet soap tomorrow. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of This Above All, starring Barbara Stanwyck as Prudence Cathaway and Tyron Power as Clive Briggs. Prudence Cathaway's first leave. Over and over, she's told herself that she must go home. But her family's waiting. And now, almost against her will, she finds herself on a train going in the opposite direction with a man she hardly knows. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen you with your cap off before. Let me look at you. Oh, well, my hair really needs a wave. But in the work, the girl can't really attend to her coiffure. Honey top. It's very pretty. <laughs> no. Prue? For six whole days, we can forget about the war. Everything. Seven days, really. Six nights and seven days. All Sunday, all Monday, all Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Prue. Clive, if someone should come in. He'd see me kissing you. <laughs> Clive. Oh, look, we're passing a watercress farm. We used to have one when I was a little girl, and I adored it. Did you know you could grow mustard and cress on old pieces of flannel? One of our gardeners used to do it. One of your gardeners? Mm -hmm. How many gardeners precisely do you have? Well, we had five. Five? And when you were a child, you had six nurses and ten rocking horses, I suppose. What on earth did you want five gardeners for? We didn't want them. The garden did. Five gardeners. Oh, you talk like one of those Hyde Park tub thumpers. Who do you suppose keeps this blessed land in decent condition if it isn't that poor tax bled landowners? You know, Prue, you're very pretty. Tall, slim, and cool. But you're a stranger. I met a waff in the dark, and I haven't got a gardener to my name. Oh, why do you punish yourself, Clyde? You ask me questions. How big is our house? How much land have we got? 
And when I tell you, you you look at me as if a fireproof curtain had come down between us. What does it matter? Oh, darling, nothing matters. We're on a holiday for six long, wonderful days. And you're very beautiful. Well, that's better. A moment ago, I was only pretty, and now I'm beautiful. We're getting along nicely, aren't we? Very nicely. Coming, sir, coming. Oh, we want two rooms, please. Have you two good ones? The best, sir. 114 and 116, both facing the sea. Oh, fine, we'll take them. Excuse me, Prue, I'll pay off the cab. I'll wait here for you. You have my forwarding address, I suppose? Yes, we have it. We're sorry you're leaving, Lady Catherway. Porter, my bags. Aunt Iris. Well, Prudence, what are you doing? Are you on leave? Yes, I am. I, I wrote to Father. Uh, Prue, I'll be a few minutes yet. Why don't you go on upstairs? Oh. Oh, I see. Aunt Iris, I... Porter, will you bring my bags? At once, please. Well, darling, how do you like your room? It's, um, very nice. Oh, sea air, moonlight. It's sure to be fine tomorrow, and we shall have a clear view of the Germans in Calais. What more can man desire? Are you tired, Prue? Oh, I, I, I'm all right, thanks. What's the matter? Nothing. Now, look here. If you've suddenly changed your mind, say so. You're free to do exactly as you like. I'm now. perfectly aware of that. What's happened, Prue? You were happy enough on the train. I know. I, I, I just didn't realize. Do you want to go back tonight? Well, you wanted me to come here. Well, here I am. So please stop asking me what I want to do. I'll tell them that we won't need the room. No, Clive, don't, please. I understand. No, you don't. The fact is, I ran into my Aunt Iris in the lobby. Your Aunt who? Aunt Iris, while you were paying the cabman. Funny how romantic a thing like this can be when nobody knows about it. But the romance goes when an Aunt Iris appears, doesn't it? Suddenly it all appears quite sordid and shabby. Oh, Clive, you know that's not true. Of course it's true. You're leaving because of your Aunt Iris, aren't you? Well, perhaps it was a little silly of me, Look but here, I... Prue. Do you feel you're doing anything wrong being here with me? No. We're not doing anything to be ashamed of. Then your only reason for leaving is because of what this aunt of yours might think. Well, You're I... the one that decides. Shall I ring for the porter to take the bag? Or do we send for supper? <laughs> I am famished. So am I. Supper it is. No good. Come on. You don't want to die here. Don't. You can't. What are you waiting for? It's no use. It's no use. Clive. Clive, wake up. What is it? Who, who's that? It's me, Prue. You were calling out in your sleep. Oh? I, I heard you, and I came in to see if you were all right. Calling out, was I? What is it, Clive? You are all right, aren't you? What was I saying? Well, I don't know. Something about... Dying. It's nothing, Prue. Don't worry. It's just that sometimes when I get overtired, I talk in my sleep. Sorry if I woke you up. Would you like me to stay until you fall asleep again? No, 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 please. Honestly, it's nothing. All right, Clive. Good night. Good night. Oh, they're, they're firing again. Yes. Clive. Yes? You were in the army, weren't you? Yes. Why didn't you tell me? Why should I? We're on a holiday, and anyway, I'm out of it now. Were you wounded? No, I... I was ill. Is that all? I can hear the planes. I'd say there's half a dozen flying quite low. How can you tell? By the sound. You learned that in France. Oh, please, Prue. What was it like, Clive? You won't be satisfied till I tell you, will you? Well, it was dirty, foul, disgusting. Do you want any more? Not if you feel like that. Well, how did you expect me to feel? Proud. Proud? I'm proud to see you there, Clive. Oh. What's that? Shrapnel. I'm afraid I'm not very brave. Come here. Sit here next to me. You are brave. And very beautiful. That's funny, isn't it? Supposing they dropped a bomb. Supposing I was killed and they found me in the room of a strange man. I shouldn't let you down. I'd go into your room. <laughs> But if you were killed, too, both of us, just as we are now... Then we'd both be dead and we'd... That was a bomb. The closer it was, the safer we're going to be from now on. It's one in a million for two bombs to land on the same spot. It was worse than the Saddam Kirk, wasn't it? It was a hundred times worse. Clive. Yes? I'm so glad you were there. Good night. Good night. Good night. 
Breakfast, sir. May I come in? Oh, good morning. Prue, breakfast. Coming. Well, what happened? Much damage last night? A direct hit on the old skating rink, sir. But as the town council was going to pull it down this winter, the Luftwaffe saved the taxpayers 100 pounds. Uh, mind the coffee pot, sir. Oh. Breakfast. Oh, Clive, it looks so good. Good morning. Feeling better this morning? Mm-hmm. Are you? Oh, I slept like a top, finally. Sit down. Oh, soldiers never die. Listen. Never die. That'll be Monty. Never I'd know that die. voice anywhere. Your friend? I'll go back to my room. What, <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy, old cock spatter? Uh, hello, Monty. Oh. Oh, sorry, Nipper. I uh, didn't know you had company. I, I didn't expect to see you, Monty. Yes, I got leave. And then I heard you were here. And oh, so... uh, this is Prudence Cathaway, my friend Monty. Pleased to meet you, miss. Good morning. Won't you sit down, Mr... Oh, might as well call me Monty, miss. Everybody else does. Well, um, you'll want to be dressing, Prue. Oh, don't you mind me, miss. Look here, Monty. As a matter of fact, this is her room. Oh, sorry, miss. <laughs> my error. Now, would you... Like to come along and see where I sleep? Yeah. What made you come here? Oh, just down for a binge, Nipper. In here. Look, oh, sorry, Nipper. <laughs> Put my foot right in it that time. Uh, did you bring her here with you, or did you find her down here? She came with me, of course. Oh, or do I guess that? Accidents like this don't happen quite so neat. She's a nice girl. Oh, of course she is. Well, she is. I said so, didn't I? How long is your leave, Monty? 24 hours. First train up in the morning. Well, come on. We'll have a drink. Oh, wait a minute, Nipper. We've got things to talk about. How much does she know about you, I mean? Look, Monty, you said you'd come for a binge. All right, we'll have a binge. Now, come and have a drink on me. Okay, okay. On one condition. Dinner tonight's on me. Suppose we sit here. I'll get the drinks, Monty. What's yours, Prue? Sherry, please. Part of the old and mild for me, Nipper. It won't be long. Okay. Bit of all right, this, isn't it? Oh, uh, be meaning to tell you, miss, I'm, uh, I'm sorry I crashed in like I did this morning. That's all right. It's uh, tough on a girl when she has to meet her chap's friends, but don't you worry. You needn't judge him on me. He's class, he's educated, a real gent. Clive thinks a great deal of you too, Monty. Were you in France together? Oh, I'll say we were. Was he, was he a good soldier over there? Was he a good soldier? Well, if you'd seen him coming up the road from Arras, ration bags slung over his back, coming through cool as a cucumber, why, you wouldn't have to ask me if he was a good soldier. And I'll tell you something else. He's up for a medal. He is? Yes, for carrying his wounded company officer the last two miles down the road to Dunkirk. And then giving up his place in the boat to help the wounded. Tell me about it. Well, it was after the Belgians threw up the sponge. Look. Here's the street in Douai where we had to fight a rear guard action. When you two have won the war, give me a call. You'll find me at the bar. Five. Monty's telling me about the medal you won. What medal? Well, haven't you heard yet? Oh, you're up for a medal, me lad. You're a blooming hero. What are you talking about? In fact, I got it first hand from the sergeant major. Monty! Hello, Monty! Hello there! How are you, Bert? Artie? I didn't know you were here, Monty. Here, meet my friends. Clive Briggs, Miss Cathaway. Here, Clive, these are the boys from the East Kemp Fusiliers. How are you? How are you? How do you do? Hello. Uh, how about a drink? Uh, well, the fact is, we tossed with the privilege of asking the young lady for a dance, and I was the lucky one. Oh, I'd like to dance. Do you mind, Clive? Oh, go ahead. Why, thanks. That's fine. Drinks on me, Jen. She's a nice kid. Why don't you keep your mouth shut, Molly? All right, all right. I didn't start it. She asked me. Ask you what? Oh, look here, Nipper. I don't like talking this way, but time's getting short, and maybe it's our last chance. You might as well face it. Absent without leave is one thing, desertion's another. They gave you a month's sick leave on the 10th of July, and today's the 15th of September. Now, we've been pals a long you time... You can save your breath, Monty. I'm not going back. All right, Nipper. Here it is. The captain himself called me last Monday. He said, you're his pal, Monty. Try and find him and bring him back before it's too late. If he's not here by midnight Monday, he'll be posted as a deserter. Very noble of the captain to be so concerned about me. Oh, let's talk sense, Nipper. Every one of us has fought the same as you at one time or another. We get such dead, sick and tired that we're ready to clear out and never come back. Not even if they shoot us. But when the time comes, we always do go back. Now, you don't understand, Marty. It's bigger than what you're talking about. Bigger than me, and yet it's... 
It's deep down inside me. Oh, it's nothing to do with being afraid or sleeping in the mud or going without food. It, it just doesn't bear talking about. It. It's there and nothing can ever change. Oh, look, Nipper, we can't get away with it. Every day it gets tougher. With their military police stopping everybody for their papers, as sure as I'm sitting here, they'll pick you up. Here you are. She's a fine dancer, Jen. Thank you. I enjoyed it's it. The pleasure's on my side. See you later, Jen. What was that you were saying, Monty? We'll pick him up. What, uh, what, uh, uh, why, these, um, these motorists on the road, you know, if a man's in uniform, they'll always pick him up and give him a lift. Oh, yes. The war's made people more generous somehow. Has it? Never die. Oh, soldiers, never die. They simply fade away. <laughs> Come on, Clive, join in. Not tonight, Monty. Oh, why, I've heard you sing that song a hundred times. hundred times, miss. Oh, soldiers never die. Come on, Nipper. I said no. Oh, just for me. I'm an old soldier, ain't I? And so are you, Nipper. One of the best. Believe me, miss, he If is. you want me, I'll be at the bar. Here, Nipper, come back here. I say Nipper. Never die. Never Monty seemed a bit wobbly tonight. Do you think he got to his room all right? Oh, Monty can take care of himself. What were you two talking about so mysteriously all evening? Oh, please, No, prove. really. Have you two got some horrible secret? Did you rob the church box when you were boys? Come on, what is it? Tell me, Clive. Well, it, it was about a friend of Monty's who joined up the day the war began. He was eager to fight and ready to die, ready to follow his leaders, and he did. And then he, he began to doubt. He began to wonder what it was all about and what he was fighting for. He didn't know. And no one could seem to tell him. Home and country and family, they said. Well, he had no real home. No family at all and, and country. England. He didn't know what England was. It was too big for him to grasp. I don't think this man was a coward, not in the usual sense. It's, it's just that he wasn't sure. And until he was sure, until he found an answer to all his questions, this man couldn't fight. Is Monty expected to answer these questions? Monty had nothing to offer in reply. Well, he might ask him whether it's the time to doubt and argue when his country's fighting for its life. Or oh, we all know we were unprepared, but what's the use of whining about the past when we're fighting to survive? Monty should tell his friend that there are bigger things than his conscience to fight for. Bigger than he is. Bigger than his leaders. Bigger than you, Clive, and me. If we lose our faith, what's the alternative? To be beaten in this war would be terrible, unthinkable. He's told him that. He's told him that he must fight for England. But if our armies win this war, what share will this man have in the England he has helped to save? Well, you've only told me the things that this man's brain has told him not to fight for. What about all the things his heart tells him he should fight for? What things? Well, he must ask his heart. He doesn't think with his heart. But tell me just a few. All right, I'll try. If I said England was Shakespeare and thatched roof and the countryside, he would laugh. If I said it was speakers in Hyde Park free to say what they wish and polite bobbies at the corners and those cliffs over there, he'd well, laugh again. If I said that England was the new forest deep in ferns and holly trees. If I said it was may blossoms rich in spring. And bluebells like a... Like a God-sent carpet. And the rain and the shine and the green of our blessed land. If I said it was the shout of a newsboy on the corner. Or the sound of a taxi horn or the age and dignity of our cities. If I, if I tried to say it's all the things that make the pride and joy and gentle gladness of the British people, well, I, I would use words badly and shame the things themselves by doing so. But if I could make him see England, why, it, it's Monty and the boys coming up the road from Douai. It's you, Clive, helping the weaker men into the boat instead of getting in yourself. Whatever this man is, 
blood and bone, mind and heart and spirit. England made him every part of him. And, and when he says the word England, it must be for him as it is for me. Like music that's rich beyond the power of music. Those other things. And he's got to go back and fight for them. Because that's England, too. Knowing that we'll never give in. Knowing that we won't be beaten. We won't. We just won't. My dear Prue, I would no more attempt to destroy what you believe than I would tell a child that Father Christmas did not exist. I am going away, where I don't know, and I don't care. I'm tired. I just want to say how decent you were. I wish I had been more decent to you. Our coming from the darkness into the light of knowing each other was very, very sweet. Shall we meet again after all this is over? I hope so. Goodbye, my dear. Bye. Pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille presents Tyrone Power and Barbara Stanwyck in Act Three of This Above All. And now here's our Hollywood reporter, Libby Collins. Welcome back to our Lux Radio Theater, Libby. I suppose you're just as busy as ever keeping up with the stars. Well, just keeping up is a full-time job these days. Um, now take Rosalind Russell, for instance. Any day, Libby. She's one of my favorite stars. <laughs> you have millions agreeing with you there. Well, at present, Rosalind's making a picture in which she plays a part of a girl flyer on a secret mission in the pre-war Pacific. Sounds like a pretty exciting role, Libby. Mm, yes. And when she's finished the picture, there's another thrilling job waiting for her. And that is? Well, she's been asked to resume entertaining at the Army and Navy post, and she may even tour the Pacific in reality, just as she does in make-believe in her picture. Well, Libby, that would be something. Wouldn't she be a heartwarming sight to our boys out there? Rosalind's a real beauty, with her dark hair and eyes and lovely, fresh complexion. It's a real Lux complexion. Rosalind says she always uses Lux toilet soap for daily beauty care. And I know some cakes of smooth white Lux soap will go with her on that tour. More than ever these days, Lux soap is important to give precious complexions quick, effective care. Yes, Libby, it's a fact that Lux soap has a leading role in the daily beauty ritual of many of the loveliest ladies in the country. Screen stars love Lux Toilet Soap's rich, creamy lather, active lather, that removes stale cosmetics, every trace of dust and dirt, in a twinkling, and does it so gently, too. Delicate skin needs gentle, cherishing care. And nine out of ten Hollywood stars use Lux Toilet Soap. Now there's a beauty tip for smart women everywhere. Thanks, Libby, for bringing that valuable beauty hint to the ladies in our audience. And here's another I'd like to add. Lux toilet soap is thrifty, too. This luxurious soap costs you so little. Why not get three cakes of Hollywood's beauty soap tomorrow? Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. The curtain rises on the third act of This Above All, starring Tyrone Power and Barbara Stanwyck. <laughs> Clive has gone, turning his back on Prue's burning image of an embattled England, an England that needed him, 
that was fighting for his very existence. A fugitive, wanted by the military police, forever in flight, and tortured by the conflict in his own heart, Clive is a man without a country, an outcast in his own land. Here, what's all this? Are you? Wake up! What are you doing here? Uh, what? What are you doing in my barn? Oh, I... I slept here. I'm on a walking trip. Walking, eh? Where's your haversack? You can go for a walking trip without a haversack, can't you? You'd better come along and explain yourself. There's a spy loose around here. That'll be silly. You're coming with me, do you hear? Let go, you fool. No, no you don't, you dirty spy. Hey, you... Let's go with that pitchfork. Ow! Yes, come in. Oh, I'm sorry to trouble you, ma'am. I've had a slight accident. I don't think it's much, but it doesn't seem to stop bleeding. I wondered if you'd be kind enough to bind it up. Come in. Thank you. It's a silly thing. I, I took a fall from my motorbike. Hmm. You really ought to have it stitched. I'm only the district nurse. They would have done it much better at the hospital. I know, but I, uh, I hadn't time to find the hospital. I'm in rather a hurry. Where did you say you left your motorbike? At a garage. They're putting it right. On the Midhurst Road? Yes. Did you see them go by, Mom? See who go by? The police. There's been a fight, Mom. A spy. Who told you that? Mr. Robinson told the teacher. They found a spy in Mr. Bristow's barn. They had an awful fight. Mr. Bristow wounded him with a pitchfork, but, but he got away. Go and get your lunch, Jackie. Oh, okay. I'd like to meet a spy. I'd show him. You... You hadn't time to find the hospital? Uh, no. It's on the Midhurst Road, half a mile from here. You couldn't miss it very well. Yes, I know, I'm but... I'm sorry. I'll have to telephone the police. I'm not a spy. Please believe me. But you must have this dress again. It really needs a stitch. Give me ten minutes. Then do whatever you like. Even huntsmen give a stag ten minutes start. You'd better go now. I wish I could thank you. I only did my duty. And it's your duty to tell the police? Yes. Goodbye. Thank you. Morning, Rector. Morning, Officer Tompkins. Lovely head you have this year, Rector. Thank you, Tompkins. But uh, haven't I missed you the last two Sundays at services? Well, sir, the truth is we've been rather busy lately. They say a lot of German spies come over with our chaps from Dunkirk disguised as Tommies. We got word of a young fellow acting peculiar in Midhurst yesterday. But all they had against him was a wounded hand. Well, goodbye, sir. Don't forget the police concert. I'll be there. Goodbye. It's a long way to Tipperary. Don't be frightened, Rector. I'm not a German spy. You can search me for weapons if you like. What are you doing here? Hiding. If you're not a spy, may I ask why you're hiding? I'm a deserter. You look tired. I'm going to have my tea. Would you care to join me? Well, thank you. I, I would like a cup of tea. This way. Uh, don't walk on the graves, please. You know, it's a funny thing, but... I never thought I would ever place such priceless value on four walls of fire and a cup of tea. Is that all you really need? No. I think most of all I need peace of mind. You must forgive me if I'm rather conventional, but did you ever try to pray? <laughs> I prayed all right. When you're in a jam, you pray. I prayed at Dunkirk. But where do you intend to go now? Oh, suppose I could stay here and cry sanctuary... And you bar the door, and no one can take me away. Isn't that the ancient rite of your church? We have no physical sanctuary any longer. But there is a greater one, a spiritual sanctuary. I'm sorry I was rude. <laughs> that doesn't matter. I see you as a symbol of our age. An age of reason that's driven out the age of faith. All the reason in you calls out against going back to fight in a war that seems warped and ill-defined. But the faith in you says that you must fight so that England shall not go down. There was a girl who said that. A beautiful girl who believed that. Your mind and your soul are deadlocked in a struggle. Your body is the battleground. Oh, but you get so tired. So exhausted. The time comes when you just can't go on running anymore. But maybe you're right. Perhaps the best thing would be to give myself up. Hello, 
this number 14, Waff Camp Gosley? Yes, it is, sir. Uh, I've been trying to reach Prudence Cathaway. Will you please... She's coming to the phone now, sir. Just a moment. Oh, thank you. Hello? Prue. Prue, darling. Clive, is that you? Oh, Clive. Listen. What happened? Are you ill? No, no, I'm all right. Darling, where are you? What are you doing? I'm calling from a hotel near London. Prue, I must see you. I'm going to give myself up. Do you hear me? Oh, Clive, don't do anything. Please, don't do anything before you see me. Promise. Of course. Prue, do you think you could come to me? We'll be married. Married? Can you get away? Can you get leave? Oh, oh, I'll come, Clive. Don't give yourself up. Don't do anything until I see you. What time can you be in London? I can catch a train about seven. I can be there at half past nine. Oh, Prue, you're so beautiful. And I love you so much. You do believe me, don't you? I'll be waiting at Charing Cross Station under the big clock. Don't miss the train, darling. I won't. I love you, Prue. I love you, Clive. Until tonight. At Charing Cross. Goodbye, darling. That'll be uh, one and six for the call, sir. Oh, uh, here you are. And uh, there's a policeman wants a word with you, sir. One moment, please. Your identity card. Well, sir? I haven't got one. I'm a... um... You'll have to come along with me to headquarters. And uh, where did you go from Leaford? I'm not sure. I traveled by night. I, I don't know the places. I see. Uh, according to the deposition here, you had already made up your mind to surrender. Yes, sir. But I wanted just one evening. This evening. I was to meet someone. I want you to believe me, sir, when I, when I say that it means more to me than I can possibly explain. You volunteered on the first day of the war? Yes, sir. Arras, Dunkirk mentioned twice in dispatches, recommended for the Distinguished Conduct Medal. I, I don't quite understand. I tried my best to fight, sir, until... until I just couldn't fight any longer. Sir, I, I know I have no right to ask any favors, but I'm ready to take whatever consequences there may be for my past conduct. But will you trust me, sir? I give you my word of honor that I'll be back here in two hours. Sergeant Graves? Yes, sir. Sergeant. I'm giving this man leave until 12 o'clock. Yes, sir. I... I don't know how to thank you, sir. I'll be here, I promise. Let it stop, sir. Looks like Jelly's with us again. Yes. I'm afraid our young friend may have some difficulty in keeping his appointment. Badly burned. Oh, you must help me. You must. Stop burning to death. There's nothing to be done, madam. Don't you understand? Oh, please, please. All right. I'll try to get them out. Get her into an ambulance. You can't go in there, mister. You're crazy. You'll be killed. Let's go. Lend me a hand with this grate. You'll never make it. You'll never come out of here alive. Oh, save them. Save them. There he is. There he is coming up now. He made it. Give him a hand. Here, quickly. Take the baby. I'm going down for the man. He's unconscious. Wait. That wall's going to collapse. Come back. Look out. Come out. Come out. Father, how is he? Is he all right? Hmm, it's, it's hard to say. He came through the operation all right, but there's no telling in a case of this type. There's... Still the danger of hemorrhage. We can only wait. May I see him? Of course. Come in, dear. Clive. Hello. Hello, darling. How did we get here? There was an air raid. You were hurt. Oh, yes. How long have I been here? Since last night. Last night. True. There was an officer of the military police. He gave me leave, and I promised to go back. Oh, don't worry. Everything's all right. We've spoken to him. 
I'm sorry I couldn't meet you last night at Charing Cross under the big clock. As long as we found each other, darling. This is my father. He operated on you. Well, young man, they certainly seem to have had a grudge against you, but that was a fine job you did, getting those people out of that cellar. Dr. Cathaway, has Prue told you that I want to marry her? She's told me everything, my boy. We're going to be married, Clive. You wait and see. Now, Prue. Today, Prue. Please. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. I now pronounce you man and wife. This is your wedding present from Monte. A package of cigarettes. Poor Monte. He said he didn't have time to get anything else. He'll be in to see you when you're better. And, oh yes, the captain sent something here. What is it? A book of Shakespeare. I've just been looking at it while you were asleep. Listen. This above all, to thine own self be true. I know that. Hamlet. This above all, to thine own self be true. And it must follow as the night the day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. Yes. You must sleep now, Clive. You're tired. This above all. To thine own self be true. You know, a strange thing happened yesterday when that officer gave me leave to meet you. As I stood there waiting for his decision, I seemed to be two men struggling against each other. One was hoping desperately to be given his freedom, and yet the other, deep down inside him, was half hoping that his request would be refused. So that all the things he made himself believe would be justified. Please rest now, darling. And then, when I was rushing to meet you at the station, and saw those people trapped in the ruins, reason shouted at me that it, it was none of my business, that other men would do the rescue work. But something just forced me to stop. We have trusted our minds too much, I suppose. And our hearts not enough. Oh, they're at it again. They won't leave us alone. Well, I feel safe with you, Clive, remember? The nearer the bombs drop, the safer we shall be from then on. Cathaway, you'll have to leave now. I'd rather stay in this if you don't mind. You're in air raid, Miss Cathaway. We don't allow for I know, I know, but I'd like to stay, please. Very well, I'm too busy to argue with you anyhow. Yes, dear. Your cap. Won't you take it off? Of course. Mary, is that better? It's so lovely. You're so... Clive. Clive, dear. Drew, you'd better go downstairs. Father, something's wrong. Look at him. I'll take care of him. You run along. No, I've stayed this long. I want to stay on. You can't help him, Prue. It would be just the same if you went down to the shelter. But you can't let a man die alone, even if they don't know. Why are you giving up so easily? I've told you there's a chance for him. If he lives through the night, he'll pull through. Oh, please, please let me stay. All right, dear. Excuse me. We'll have to move this patient. Move him? Those who can't be taken downstairs, we have orders to move them under the bed. Oh, no. No, I won't let you. Don't, please. Please don't humiliate him like that. gone, haven't they? Yes, they've gone. It's morning, dear. But you won't leave me. No. Do you feel better, darling? Yes. I'm better. I feel clearer. You know, Prue, I've been thinking. When this is all over, it's going to be a different world. Yes, darling. You were right, Prue. We'll win this war. I'll help to win it. I'll do everything I can. We'll win the war. And then with God's help, we'll win the peace, too.
This is the people's war. And this, above all, is part of the people's testimony of faith in the outcome. Our congratulations to Barbara Stanwyck and Tyrone Power on the sincerity of tonight's performance. Well, thank you, sir. It was a privilege to have a part in opening the Lux Radio Theater's new season. You know, Barbara, as the audience was applauding at the end of the play, I remembered that I once arrested Tyrone Power in Denver. Well, Ty, your past is catching up with you. <laughs> it, it wasn't Ty, it was his father, Barbara. He was the culprit and I was the sheriff in a play about uh, 38 years ago. Oh, wasn't Mrs. DeMille in that company, too? Indeed she was. We often speak of it. Incidentally, Tyrone, your father certainly looked handsome and tight in some of the Shakespearean plays. Oh, uh, well, how did that young juvenile Cecil DeMille look in tights? Well, we, uh, <laughs> we won't go into that just now, Bob. <laughs> All right. Then we'll change the subject to something that won't embarrass you, C.B. In words of one syllable, it's luck self. I've used it for years. But I'll bet I don't need to tell this audience what a grand complexion care Lux Soap is. Mm, your proof of Lux Soap is right in the mirror, Barbara. Now, what's your play going to be next Monday, C.B.? Next week, we present another of the really great dramas of recent years. The 20th Century Fox picture, How Green Was My Valley. Oh. And the stars will be Walter Pigeon, Donald Crisp, and Maureen O'Hara. How Green Was My Valley won the Academy Award as the finest green production of last year. We'll have three stars from the original cast next Monday night. So don't miss Walter Pigeon, Donald Crisp, and Maureen O'Hara in this prize-winning play. Now, that sounds like a capacity audience for you, C.B. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I must tell you that this is the last time we'll be able to have Tyrone Power in the Lux Radio Theater for months, or perhaps years to come. <laughs> He's made a contract with Uncle Sam, and within the next few weeks, he'll report to the United States Marine Corps as Private Tyrone Power. Good luck on every one of us, Ty. Thank you, Barbara. I hope to be back here in the Lux Radio Theater when it's over, CB. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, Barbara. Good night, Devil Dog. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Walter Pigeon, Donald Crisp, and Maureen O'Hara in How Green Was My Valley. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Barbara Sandwich is now making the universal picture flesh and fantasy. Tyrone Power appeared tonight through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studio. His latest picture is The Black Swan. Heard in tonight's play were James Kirkwood as Roger, Stuart Robertson as Monty, Claire Vedera as Iris, Norman Field as the rector, and Frederick Warlock, Josephine Gilbert, Vernon Steele, Herman Waldeman, Thomas Mills, Verna Felton, Charles Seal, Barbara Denny, Colin Campbell, Bruce Payne, Eric Snowden, Fred Mackay, and Billy Roy. Tune in next Monday night to hear Walter Pidgeon, Donald Crisp, and Maureen O'Hara in How Green Was My Valley. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been John M. Kennedy. Why drag along half-alive, nervous, vitamin-starved? Get that VIMS feeling. VIMS are the new low-cost vitamin mineral tablets.